This film is about the punishment of a whole nation, the killing of hundreds of thousands of people, many of them young children. These are the people of Iraq, the silent victims, not only of Saddam Hussein, their dictator, but of an endless war against civilians waged by Western governments. I have said to the people of Iraq that our quarrel was not with them, but instead with their leadership, and above all with Saddam Hussein. You, the people of Iraq, are not our enemy. We do not seek your destruction. Our foreign policy must have an ethical dimension and must support the demands of other peoples for the democratic rights on which we insist for ourselves. Our quarrel is not with the Iraqi people. It never has been. What the crime the Iraqi children were done to receive this punishment? What a crime. On August 2, 1990, after a dispute over shared oil fields, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Four days later, the United Nations Security Council imposed economic sanctions, the most comprehensive in modern history. Almost everything was denied the people of Iraq, including, for the first eight months, food and medicine. Today, ten years later, sanctions are still in place and the United Nations reports widespread chronic malnutrition and death among young children, an unprecedented human rights disaster. What happens when modern civilized life is taken away? Imagine all the things we take for granted are suddenly not available or severely limited. Clean water, fresh food, soap, paper, pencils, books, light bulbs, life-saving drugs. Telephone calls to the outside world are extremely difficult. Computers no longer work. When you fall ill, you must sell your furniture to buy medicine. When you have a tooth out, there's no anesthetic. No country will trade with yours, and your money is almost worthless. Soon your children become beggars, it's as if the world has condemned your whole society to a slow death, and all because of a dispute between governments over which you have no control. That's what has happened here in Iraq, where almost 10 years of extraordinary isolation imposed by the UN and enforced by America and Britain have killed more people than the two atomic bombs dropped on Japan, including half a million young children. These are the children the West has forgotten. Ten years ago, Iraq was a developed country whose oil had brought great wealth, but also a dependency on imported food and other essentials. Today, the death rate of children under five is over 4,000 every month. That's 4,000 more than would have died before sanctions. This is a typical hospital ward which sanctions have denied basic equipment and the kind of life-saving drugs available in any British hospital. Ali Raf Aswadi, nine years old, yes. present to us with a progressive pallor and uh, he has, bone, he has, leukemia. 
Now we just start treatment. Some of the drugs is not available. Not all the drugs is available. We give a blood transfusion. I tell you before, there is no blood bags enough. Do you get these drugs some of the time? Some of the time for but two, three weeks and then stop. No drugs. So you can't continue a course of we the drugs? We couldn't continue a course of treatment. Mm -hmm. There's interrupted treatment and some of the sometimes there is no treatment at all. Case of neuroblastoma. And that's that's a very unusual tumor. This is before we don't see this before. Now in these years we see many cases of neuroblastoma. You've never seen no, this? No. Hmm. No. Before there is only one cases per two years, every two years. Well, Dr. 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 Ali, what, what will happen to this child? This is Abdominal mass. The operation was done to him, yeah. but the tumor not received treatment. The tumor recurs again. So there is relapse. There's recurrence of a tumor, so, and now we start some of the drugs. Not all the drugs is available. So his future is is not is uncertain. It's, it's bad. 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 Because there is renal shutdown. He developed renal failure. The problem with treating cancer is that you've got to give the drugs at the right time in the right sequence, usually over a period of about six months, monthly visits, maybe two weekly visits. Now, with cancer, you only get one bite at the cherry. In other words, if you give them the right sequence at the right time, you have a high chance of curing a range of tumours, including those in children. If you do it wrongly, give them at the wrong time, so even though you have all the drugs, but they come at different intervals, as is happening in Iraq, you don't get nearly such a high success rate. So an 80% cure rate is translated into a 30% cure rate. Same drugs given in the wrong sequence. Also neuroblastoma. This is this unusual malignancy on the nervous system. Yes. Which uh, you've only seen now. Yes, we see yeah. many cases now. Many cases Many now. cases now. Before yeah. we see only one case or two cases every two or three years. Now we see many cases. Uh, 11 years old, this. Also, look. She's uh, malnourished. Malnourished. Uh, we start treatment today yeah. with available drugs. And some of the drugs is missed. VM, I tell you, VM26 yeah. is not available. Yeah. Are there many children who never come to hospital? Many children, many children. Because a very poor family and we couldn't get this paying for treat the children. Yes, Rick. Kadam Saleh. Five and a half years old. Mm -hmm. This is case of Hodgkin. 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 Yeah. Eh. This is also newly diagnosed. Uh, some of the drugs is not available. So a child with normally with Hodgkin's disease can yeah. expect to live. Um, and live and about to improve with 95 percent. 95 percent. 95 percent cure. Oh. But if the drug is not available, maybe lead to the other complication. Case malnourished with leukemia, newly diagnosed leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Also, you see very poor family. We start treatment by medication, available medication, and some of the drugs is missing for treatment. Thiaguani is not available. You look, most of the children is malnourished. Yeah. And this child is how old? Two years old. Two. We've just been around this ward. All these children have a very, very uncertain future. How, how does that, how do you feel about that? As a very, I am very sad. But all of the children look like our daughter or my son. And when you see my son in front of me dying, what happened to you? This is the Security Council, center of power at the United Nations in New York. In 1996, the Council allowed Iraq to sell some of its oil reserves in order to buy food and other basic needs. This is known as oil for food. 
All the money from the sale of Iraq's oil is controlled by the Security Council, which the United States dominates and with Britain takes a hard line on Iraq. Everything that goes to Iraq must be approved by a special sanctions committee run by the Council. This committee has consistently blocked the restoration of basic services in Iraq, power, light and clean running water. For the children of Iraq, oil means food. Although the Iraqis have been told they can repair their damaged oil industry, contracts for vital equipment have been blocked or delayed in New York. Currently, more than a billion and a half dollars worth of desperately needed shipments are on hold, including food, life-saving medical equipment, such as equipment to diagnose and treat cancer, and x-ray machines, heart and lung machines, firefighting equipment, agricultural equipment, and toilet soap. The stated aim of the sanctions is to eradicate Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Just before last Christmas, the Department of Trade and Industry in London blocked a shipment of vaccines intended to protect Iraqi children against yellow fever and diphtheria. The vaccines, said the minister, are capable of being used in weapons of mass destruction. This is Dennis Halliday, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, the man in charge of the humanitarian operation in Iraq. In 1998, he resigned, accusing the West of destroying a whole society. We took him on his first trip back, in the cancer clinic of this hospital in Baghdad, he had a remarkable reunion with a young girl whose life he helped to save. John, this is uh, Safa Majid and her father, who is Majid Ali. Safa I met two years ago uh, in this hospital when she was in a very poor condition of leukemia. And uh, one cannot deal with thousands, but one can deal with one or two or three or four children. And I was able, with the help of the World Health Organization, to bring in drugs, although be it illegally, from overseas. Enough for two years of treatment for this little girl. And today she looks wonderful, beautiful, and she has only now treatment once every month. So I think she's almost cured of leukemia. She is one of four, wasn't she? One of four. Tell me about the others. Well, within the first five weeks of meeting these four children, two died simply for lack of medications, or it was too late, in fact, to save their lives. And there were two little girls, including Safa, who, who have survived. Why did they die? They died because they had sophisticated problems, which the medications were not available. And when you set out to help these children, you were the United Nations representative here. That's right. And to do it, what you're saying is you had to act illegally. I had to breach my own economic sanctions, so to speak, established by the Security Council, as we know, led by Washington and by London. I think in this hospital we've seen today evidence of the killing that is now the responsibility of the Security Council member states. Particularly, I think, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. They should be here with us. They should see the impact of what their decisions and their sustaining of economic sanctions means. The very provisions of the Charter and the Declaration of Human Rights have been set aside. And we are waging a warfare through the United Nations on the children and people of Iraq with incredible results. Results that you do not expect to see in a war under the Geneva Conventions. We're targeting civilians. Worse, we're targeting children like Safa, who, of course, were not born when Iraq went into Kuwait. I mean, what is this about? It's a monstrous situation for the United Nations, for the Western world, for all of us who are part of some d democratic system, who are, in fact, responsible for the policies of our governments and the implementation of economic sanctions on Iraq. When the U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, was asked on American television if she thought the death of more than half a million children 
was a price worth paying, she replied, we think the price is worth it. We don't accept the half a million figure. So if you say that Secretary Albright said, oh, a half a million was a price worth paying, we don't accept that. It's the World Health Organization. I understand yeah. that's their figure, and it's a derived by a methodology that we don't accept. We do accept the, uh, the idea that in choosing and making policy, one has to choose usually between two bad choices, not between a good choice and a, and a bad choice. And unfortunately, the effect of sanctions has been uh, more than we would have hoped. What we've tried to do is to limit that effect. As I indicated, through the uh, Oil for Food and other programs to try to provide uh, food and medicine for the people of Iraq. And so, yes, when Secretary Albright was talking about the hard choice, she was acknowledging the hard choice between um, uh, the effect of sanctions and the, the idea of letting Saddam Hussein run rampant. But she wasn't accepting the half million figure. How many children do you well, think have We don't have, have a figure. It's not uh, something that one can easily make, and we think some of the people who put these figures out inevitably have to uh, uh, use some dubious methodology. While Western politicians quibble about methodology, the latest United Nations study says that the death rate of children has doubled under sanctions. That's half a million dead in eight years. Hassan Rashid, 18 months old, this before disease, this after the disease, a case of neuroblastoma in 1993. The child died also because there's no drugs at all. Ali Asad, this is also a case of Hodgkin disease in 1998. He finished treatment. Some of the drugs he brings by the family, and he is cured now. So if you are rich, it's likely you live, and if you are poor... This die. Mm. If the drugs is not available in hospitals, and the family is very poor, the child, he will die soon or later, I thought that. How do you cope with this work? Very hardly. I ask that because I saw you in the corridor there. You'd broken into tears. Yes. Everything is devastating to us. It's frustrating me because I face many problems and I couldn't do anything. But, and what happened in the future? All these children is generation of the future. We lost the generation. I want to tell you some things. What the crime the Iraqi children were done to receive this punishment? What crime? Have what they a done? crime. In Baghdad, what foreigners don't see are well stocked clinics where Saddam Hussein and his rich cronies get first class treatment, an indication that sanctions have not hurt them in the slightest. Why should the civilian population, including children born since the Gulf War, innocent people, be held hostage to the compliance of a dictator? I think uh, it is a difficult problem, but you have to um, think of one thing. Uh, sanctions, a sanction regime, is not a form of development aid. Sanctions are part... Excuse, ex excuse me, is that... Are you serious in saying I'm that? Serious. I would think it's a, the very opposite, isn't it? Well, no, it? this is exactly my point. You should realize what sanctions are. Mm. And uh, sanctions are uh, one of the coercive measures that the Security Council has at its disposal under Chapter 7. That is to say, it is part of this whole this whole range of measures, starting from uh, declaration to the press, resolution, uh, then in the end, at the very end of that scale, you will have the military action. Sanctions are the measure just short of military action. And obviously, they hurt 
they are like a military measure. They're like a military action. But they who do are, they hurt? That's well, the, this is, of course, the problem. With well, military, this is the key. This know, isn't this a key point. Military, who they hurt? With military action two, you have the eternal problem of collateral damage. You have an entire nation of those collateral damage here. Forgive me for interrupting, but let me just say this. Every UN agency dealing with health, food, agriculture, and children have reported repeatedly the tens of thousands of the most vulnerable in the society uh, have, have died and are suffering as a result of sanctions. And do you seriously call that collateral damage? No, I didn't call it collateral damage. Well, you were making, you were drawing a comparison there. No, I'm saying that military action has collateral damage. Sanctions are short of military action, but they also have, of course, uh, effects that one doesn't want. And I agree with you that we have to study this further and, and more extensively to see how we can improve the situation without letting the regime off the hook with regard to the excessive documented interest of the government of Iraq for weapons of mass destruction. Well, why aren't there sanctions on Israel? which has the only um, uh, nuclear, known nucle well, nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Well, uh, Israel is a country that has been uh, surrounded by countries, by uh, countries that try to wipe it out. It's not exactly the same situation. But it has nuclear weapons. Well, yes, but we have not yet uh, attacked uh, or put sanctions on every country that... Uh, it attacks Lebanon almost every day yeah. of the week. Uh, another, well, I think these are important. Why aren't there sanctions on Turkey, which um, has displaced something like three million Kurds and uh, caused the deaths of uh, perhaps 30,000 Kurds? Why aren't there sanctions on Turkey? Yeah. Well, there are many countries that uh, do things that we are not happy with, but this is a situation which has uh, come into being due to the uh, invasion of Kuwait, and that is the explanation of it. This is Dr. Jawad Al Ali, a cancer specialist and member of Britain's Royal College of Physicians. And we should have our chest X-ray. Shows the nodules. All the lines are filled with nodules from the cancer of the breast. I don't think we can help her anymore. Well, we just support her. We treat the chest infection, uh, treat the anemia by blood transfusion, and we will wait until she will end her life. Really we have problem because the uh, complaints of pain, which is a very severe pain, unrelieved by simple analgesics or painkillers. They need uh, probably morphia. And these drugs are not available. The morphia is not available. One of the drugs that really seemed crazy that they couldn't have was morphine, the best and oldest pain control medicine in the world, and often called God's own drug, because for everybody that has cancer pain, it is the best drug. And yet they didn't have morphine. Uh, they had very little analgesics. The cancer center, when I was there, had a little bottle of aspirin pills, and yet 200 patients are in there, many of them in pain, with, with a, a, a bottle of aspirin to go around them. So it seemed a very bizarre situation. Do you believe that people have human rights no matter where they live and under what system they live? That the human rights belong to the individual? Yes. Well, well doesn't, uh, doesn't that, if you apply that to Iraq, does, don't then the effects that these sanctions are had documented by the UN itself, aren't they violating the human rights of literally millions of people. The human rights in Iraq are a very difficult subject. It is also documented in uh, 
in the United Nations that the regime has committed very serious human rights. No you're, doubt about you're that. aware of that. Of course. Yeah. So I, uh, I think we are constantly uh, concerned about human rights one way or the other. It's but they're no different. Issue. You said they're a very difficult subject, but the, to an ordinary Iraqi, human rights belong to them. This is, you would agree with that, regardless of the fact that they've been lucky or unlucky to have been born in Iraq. Doesn't hurting them violate those human rights? Yes, but obviously this is exactly why it, um, I say that we do not want to hurt the population of Iraq, and this is why we are trying to improve the system. Yeah, okay. The numbers of children, 4,000 under fives dying every month, terrible figures. These, these, this has been known for years. Why is it taking so long to deliberate on, on how to get over this so-called complex issue? I think we could have solved the matter fairly easily if all members of the Security Council were determined to improve that situation, but at the same time make sure that their guarantees that Iraq will not again develop uh, weapons of mass destruction. The fact that the major powers disagree on that makes it extremely difficult to solve the situation. We are now in the process through the Security Council of destroying the human rights of the Iraqi people. And for many of us that is an extraordinary situation where the that the, the chamber responsible for peace and security is neglecting the very provisions of the charter which forms the bases of the organization itself. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. There is no democracy in the Security Council. I think if, if the issue of sanctions on Iraq after nine long years were to go to the General Assembly, we'd see a very large majority overturning those sanctions tomorrow. On February the 13th, this man resigned his job. Hans von Sponnick, the senior United Nations representative in Iraq, followed his predecessor, Dennis Halliday, saying he could no longer tolerate the suffering caused by sanctions. I do not think it is fair for such a long period of time to make a uh, civilian population a subject to bargaining. And uh, what we are seeing here is too often exactly that. Two days later, the head of the World Food Program in Iraq, Yuta Borghart, also resigned, saying she too could not tolerate what was being done to the Iraqi people. The United Nations has not known a rebellion like this. It is neither in the interest of the future of Iraq, nor is it in the interest of a stable uh, region, nor is it in the interest of a more harmonious global community that a country like Iraq uh, should be allowed uh, to go into yet another year of uh, this kind of deprivation. And uh, this uh, discussion about how Iraq should behave or not should not be carried out on the back of the civilian population. For the past year, the pressure on top United Nations officials not to speak out has been unrelenting. This has come from the State Department in Washington and the British government. We believe the chief humanitarian coordinator in Iraq's job is not to second guess the Security Council's decisions about international peace and security, which is what the Security Council is charged with, making decisions about what would be more dangerous for the world. And we believe the world would be more dangerous if some of the humanitarian uh, UN officials' views were accepted by the Security Council. They have a job there to administer a program. I think it's a signal that somehow what I've been saying and the fact that the charge I've made uh, of genocide, for example, against the UK, is getting close to the truth. And there's an uncomfortable feeling, I think, in Washington and London that what many of us have been saying and members of parliament have been saying, for example, they know that we are correct. They know that the history books are going to write this thing in such a way that the Security Council, the United Nations, Washington, London, both are going to be slaughtered, in my view. I came to the street in Baghdad with Dennis Halliday. 
It's here that people sell their books in order to buy food and medicine for their families. What's the significance of uh, books like these? These are mostly medical books, the, the sort of books that are unlikely to see in a, in a book fair like this. Well, it, it means that uh, Iraqi professionals are obliged to sell their collections, their libraries, uh, in order to find money basically to put food on, on the table, to feed their children. And it's a tragedy in Iraq, perhaps in particular, given the history of Mesopotamia. Mm. The art of writing was developed in this country. Mm. And uh, Iraqis have an extraordinary respect for learning and for books. Mm. So this demonstrates, I think, the devastation that economic sanctions is, uh, is creating for the Iraqi people. Uh, you've seen a breakdown in the quality of life, of course, but also the interaction of people. Men have walked away from their family responsibilities because they're unemployed, they have no income, they just can't face the reality. You see children being taken out of school to put on the streets to beg or go into petty crime. There's a breakdown, violent crime has become a new phenomenon. You find corruption in Iraq, which you did not find before. You go to people, and they're, they're looking for money, they're, they're, they're ready to humiliate themselves for some money, which would never have happened in the past. So you've got this crumbling of, of standards and a lack of access to travel, to technology, to education, to books, to all the good things that we all want in life. So it's slowly dragging down, sort of a downward spiral, I would say, of, of life and its, all of its various facets. And this downward spiral is felt mostly by children. At this school, we were overwhelmed by the stench of raw sewage in the playground. Since water and sewage treatment facilities were bombed, few repairs have been possible because spare parts are routinely delayed by the sanctions committee in New York. In education, for example, it's a pitiful picture that presents itself here. We uh, have a situation which was described to me today by uh, a receptive person as a young generation that is in the refrigerator, waiting until better times come. Uh, I went this morning to uh, four primary schools in Saddam City. What you see there is absolutely making you aware that uh, the oil for food program is inadequate. These children have no desks. When the sewage comes in, they have to sit on bricks. Many of them suffer from dysentery. There's been a 125% increase in children seeking uh, help, professional help for mental health problems. Uh, from the information that we have available, about uh, one in two schools in the country is in the situation that you see around here. Homes have been sort of virtually denuded of the very basic uh, stimulation materials or play materials because most families in order to cope with the present situation have sold everything except the bare essentials they need to keep it going. We have a whole generation of children who have grown up this country in a total sense of isolation. So it, it's this combination of isolation, the dependency syndrome, the lack of opportunities to to develop a sense of self-reliance and the lack of any sense of hope in the future. This is a public auction in Baghdad. These are commonplace now, as people sell off their most intimate possessions in order to buy food and medicine. As we filmed here, prying into people's despair, we were treated with extraordinary courtesy. A United Nations report estimates that Iraq's electricity supply would increase by 50% if sanctions were lifted. People have no choice but to use crude paraffin heaters like these for cooking. They often explode.
This is the Iraqi National Orchestra, once celebrated internationally. They sound a bit tinny now. The violins need new strings, the clarinets new reeds. These and sheet music are now almost impossible to import. The conductor is Mohammed Amin Azet. His hand and arm are badly burned after a tragic accident. It was a very difficult problem for me to face because it involved the closest person to me, my wife. It was caused by the power shortages. There was no electricity and paraffin had to be used for cooking and other purposes. That's when the accident happened. It was so devastating because I saw my wife catch fire and burn completely before my eyes. I tried very hard to extinguish the fire, but I was unable to do anything. I was burnt too, but sometimes I wish I could have been completely burnt like my wife. Maybe that would have been better. We have many problems. The main problem has to do with the musical instruments. They're very old, and to repair them is very difficult. We can't import them. We are forbidden from traveling because all the invitations we receive require that we bear the travel costs to these countries ourselves. That's why we are restricted to staying inside the country, working hard on our own and trying to manage on our own. And I hope that we return to the world arena, to see and be seen by the world, and to exchange our cultures and to develop. God willing, we will. Our hope is great. Britain and America say that sanctions are aimed at the threat posed by Saddam Hussein, not at the people of Iraq. But where did Saddam Hussein come from? How did he get his weapons of mass destruction? And who gave him such power? The answers can be traced back to the discovery of the greatest of all imperial prizes, oil. In 1921, the British created yet another desert monarchy, installing a compliant king, Faisal, in Baghdad. Iraq was granted a nominal independence, with real power remaining in London, so that oil and the profits of oil continued to flow to the West. In 1958, a nationalist government swept to power in Iraq, and Washington immediately stepped in. Within five years, the Iraqi government was overthrown with help from the Central Intelligence Agency. It was, said the CIA, a great victory. The new regime was dominated by the Ba'ath Party, which by 1979 produced a leader the West could do business with, Saddam Hussein. He was a son of a bitch, said a CIA official but he was our son of a bitch. I don't think there were ever any illusions about Saddam Hussein. I mean, we knew from early on that this was a man who had uh, achieved supreme power in Iraq by personally pulling out a revolver and shooting his predecessor at a cabinet meeting. Uh, this, this was no Democrat, <laughs> no, no agrarian reformer, uh, but basically a thug, and a thug who had... Uh, uh, very uh, good ideas about how to perpetuate himself in power and who had uh, significant aspirations. 
Saddam has a great deal to thank the CIA for, for bringing the Ba'ath to power, for keeping the Ba'ath in power, for helping him personally, for providing him with financial aid during the war with Iran, for protecting him against internal coup d'etats. It's, it's a continuing relationship from the very early 1960s until now, and it's a love-hate relationship. In Washington, the relationship with Saddam Hussein was often cynically called the love affair. In the words of a U.S. Senate investigation, Presidents Reagan and Bush secretly and illegally courted Saddam Hussein with a reckless abandon. In Britain, the same love affair blossomed between the Thatcher government and Saddam Hussein. Cabinet ministers lined up to pay their respects and offer him trade deals and loans, indeed almost everything he wanted. They sold him helicopters, they sold him ammunition, uh, they sold him electronics, they sold him uh, anti-nuclear, biological and chemical warfare suits and boots. Uh, they sold him very important equipment. Britain, like, any, like many other European countries and America, all sided with Saddam Hussein in the war against Iran, and they did, not want to, they did not want to know anything else about what was happening inside Iraq, who is opposing Saddam Hussein, what violations of human rights were taking place. All these were brushed aside deliberately. They knew very well that Saddam Hussein was killing Iraqis, that the level of repression in Iraq was at an unprecedented level, that uh, he used chemical weapons against the Iranians and against Iraqis. The ingredients for Saddam Hussein's biological weapons often came from Britain and America, using anthrax made at Porton Down Laboratories and botulism developed at this company in Maryland near Washington. It was because the West had sold Saddam Hussein the means of making so many weapons of mass destruction that when sanctions were imposed, the Security Council insisted he destroy them. One of those sent to do the job was Scott Ritter, a chief United Nations weapons inspector in Iraq. In 1991, Iraq had significant capability in the area of chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons production capability, and long-range ballistic missile manufacturing capability. By 1998, the chemical weapons infrastructure had been completely dismantled or destroyed by UNSCOM or by Iraq in compliance with UNSCOM's mandate. The biological weapons program had been declared in its totality late in the game, but it was gone. All the major facilities eliminated. The nuclear weapons program, again, completely eliminated. The long-range ballistic missile program, completely eliminated. All that was left was the research and development and manufacturing capability for missiles with a range less than 150 kilometers, a permitted activity. Everything that we set out to destroy in 1991, the physical infrastructure had been eliminated. So if I had to quantify Iraq's threat in terms of weapons of mass destruction, the real threat is zero, none. What is your solution to those who say that, all right, he may not be a threat now, but he could be a threat again? Weapons inspectors must go back into Iraq and complete their mandate. Now, that mandate should be reconfigured. The mandate was drawn up in terms of quantitative disarmament. Account for every nut, screw, bolt document that exists in Iraq. And so long as Iraq didn't account for that, they were not in compliance reformulate that mandate to qualitative disarmament. Does Iraq have a chemical weapons program today? No. Does Iraq have a long-range ballistic missiles program today? No. Nuclear? No. Biological? No. Is Iraq qualitatively disarmed? Yes. Get the inspectors in, certify that, then get on with monitoring Iraq to ensure they do not reconstitute any of this capability. For those who continue to pay the price of sanctions, there is another terrible irony. Most of the Iraqi soldiers and civilians who died in the Gulf War 
belong to the Kurdish and Shia peoples, the very people President Bush called upon to rise up against Saddam Hussein. And when they did rise up in February 1991, they were brutally betrayed. By March the 5th, 1991, Saddam Hussein's rule had collapsed across southern Iraq and the popular uprising had spread here to Iraq's second city, Basra. A new start for the people of Iraq seemed close at hand. Then Saddam's old allies in Washington intervened in the nick of time. The opposition within the country, of course, listened to the West and rose against Saddam Hussein only to be confronted by the United States in particular helping Saddam Hussein against them. They actually stopped rebels who rose against him from reaching arms depots. They denied them shelter. They flew over his helicopters as his helicopters attacked them. They gave his Republican guards safe passage through their lines to attack the rebels. They did everything except join the fight on his side. This remarkable videotape was filmed in secret by two courageous Iraqis among the rebelling troops. One of the cameramen was killed. An advisor to President Bush said later, the United States could not allow the overthrow of Saddam Hussein without knowing that his replacement would support American policy. These are Iraqi soldiers who stood up to Saddam Hussein, about to be taken away and shot. The United States and the United Kingdom say the sanctions will not be lifted unless this monster is gone, unless Saddam Hussein exits. And so they use each other to justify an evil act against the Iraqi people. They only stood up to Saddam Hussein when he's threatened their interests because Saddam Hussein was our friend. This is the operative word. It is our friends versus our enemies. There is no point of principle here. There is no democracy to pursue. There are no human rights to protect. It is our friends and our interests. The main issue at stake is Iraq must not be ruined as a country and the people of Iraq must not be killed on such a, 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 on such a scale under the pretext of denying Saddam Hussein access to developing his weapons of mass destruction. The two issues are very different. Iraq is a country. Iraq is not Saddam Hussein. What will happen to the health of Iraqi people if the sanctions go on and on? I think it will deteriorate more and more. We'll have a problem of infection, we'll have a problem of malnutrition, and we'll have a problem of, uh, of cancer. In my wife's family, about six members of her family died because of cancer. One of them is uh, her mother, and the last one is her uncle, who is now under treatment because of lymphoma. A few kilometers from this area, uh, in which uh, in this family I have uh, two brothers with lymphomas and a sister again with the same lymphoma, uh, which is still alive. The two brothers died just a few years ago, and they got the cancer after the uh, the Gulf War. We diagnosed about five patients who are doctors. Two of them are male doctors. And we got three uh, lady doctors with breast cancer. 
They were resident here in this hospital. The chief medical officer of Basra, his son died because of acute leukemia. And another one in the Department of Preventive Medicine, Dr. Hisham, his son also died and it was acute leukemia. And we are very sorry about these children. Just before the war, the Gulf War, uh, we studied uh, only three or four mortalities in a month. And now we are studying 30 or 35 patients dying in our department each month. From three or four to 30 a month? Yeah, yeah. that is 10 times the, the mortality rate increased. And we have 12 times increase in the mortality of cancer patients. Wherever you go in southern Iraq, there is dust. It is in the streets, in school playgrounds. It gets into your nose and throat and eyes. And it carries the seeds of cancer. A hidden effect of sanctions is that Iraq is prevented from cleaning up its battlefields. During the Gulf War, the United States and Britain fired shells covered in depleted uranium, a source of radiation used in nuclear weapons. Professor Doug Rocky is a former US Army health physicist who was assigned to clean up Kuwait in 1991 and himself became a victim. He has 5,000 times the recommended level of radiation in his body. It was throughout all Iraq, in Kuwait, and also with the munitions testing and preparation in Saudi Arabia. So it's, it covers the entire region. The contamination was extensive. The casualties were grotesque. You have probably seen or heard of the term crispy critter. For the individual that's in a vehicle when it's struck by depleted uranium munitions, if they survive, I mean, they have burns and shrapnel, it depends on are they in the vehicle. But the ones that died, they are just literally burned to a crisp. The effect depends on whether a person inhaled it, breathed it in, ingested it, got some of it, eating it or drinking it with water or food, or if they got the uranium contamination into an open wound. If they did, then depending upon the amount that they had, what the possibilities are and what we're seeing now are respiratory problems, breathing problems, kidney problems, cancers. The Atomic uh, Committee of Iraq estimated uh, the people which are polluted to be 40 to 48 percent of the population which were living at that time in, uh, in the city. And all these patients might have cancer in their life uh, might be after one year, two years, or 10 years, or 15 years later. So half and the population... Half of the population the might have... Uh, having yes, cancer. yes, that's right. Unless the environmental cleanup is totally completed and the medical care is provided, the effects are permanent and lasting forever and ever and ever. That's wrong. As doctors, we can't prove that depleted uranium is present in the body because we haven't got the uh, equipment to detect uranium in the, in the bone. And if we got these equipment, we might prove it. You do not deny medical equipment necessary for assessment and care in the name of trying to force the government out. There's no doubt about how bad Iraq is in Saddam Hussein. But at the same time, the women and the children have no control over what he does. The women and children can't change the government. The women and children are sick and dying, but they can't get medical supplies to provide simple medical care. That's wrong. It is an epidemic, and it is, uh, we could 
uh, say it is like the Hiroshima's uh, tragedy. It is repeated here. Doctor, what do you say to those who say that it's not possible to prove the connection between depleted uranium contamination and the deformities of these children? It is not true. There is a relation between congenital malformation and depleted uranium. Before, we didn't see this at all. We see many congenital malformation and very strange things. I not see before at all. If there is no relation, why these things not happen before? And most of them, there is no family history at all. As in Hiroshima, increased percentage of congenital malformation, increase of a tumor, of malignancy, leukemia, brain tumor, also in our society increase in this percentage. Before sanctions, did you have all the drugs that you would need? Regarding malignancy, leukemia, every drug is available before the economic section. You had everything? Everything. Everything. Why has the suffering of the Iraqi people been allowed to go on year after year? Is there another agenda? Smashing Iraq gives the United States greater control over the Middle East as the West expands across a vast new oil protectorate stretching from the Persian Gulf to the former Soviet Union. Iraq may well be the blueprint for policing this new order with the weapons of sanctions and bombing. These sisters were among six children killed when an American missile hit the center of Basra in January last year. The sheer scale of the bombing of Iraq is a well-kept secret. Between May 1998 and January this year, the American Air Force and Navy flew 36,000 sorties over southern Iraq. That includes 24,000 combat missions. At this Christian monastery in the north, where St. Matthew is buried, the priests report constant bombing and the killing of people who came to watch last year's eclipse. The Royal Air Force's bombing of Iraq for one year has cost the British taxpayer more than 60 million pounds. Since December 1998, Britain and America have waged a largely hidden war here and in the south. Pilots have flown almost as many bombing missions against Iraq as NATO and its attack on Yugoslavia. And yet, with a few notable exceptions, this has been hardly reported in Britain and the United States. The bombing has no basis in law and has not been approved by the UN. British government ministers have repeatedly claimed that pilots attack only when threatened. Tony Blair told Parliament that the bombers were doing, and I quote, vital humanitarian tasks to protect the people. after it happened and I had heard that um, flocks of sheep were being bombed in north and south Iraq 
although the Ministry of Defence in Britain had denied it. So we came up to see whether it was true or not. And we found this whole area here covered with dead sheep, two sheep dogs, you know, clearly blast damage, um, a large water tank full of what appeared to be bullet holes. And we were standing here <clears throat> in the stench of the sheep and a car pulled up over there. It was a member of the extended family of the family who were killed. And he said that what had happened is it was a Friday, the Sabbath, and so the villagers had all come down and about 40 to 50 of them were sort of sharing an early morning meal. And when they went back, they left the family of six, the grandfather, the father, and four children. The eldest was 13, the youngest was called Sulman, and he was six, um, to mind the sheep. When the villagers got back, they heard the plane and they heard, and this is a very consistent story, they heard the bombs drop, and they came running down to see if they could help. And they then said that they searched from early morning until almost dusk to try and find the bodies to bury them in, within 12 hours in accordance with is Islam. And by dusk, they'd found just pieces of bodies. This is the brother of the shepherd who died. The shepherd's widow walked away from us saying, I want to speak to the pilot who killed my four children. We arrived here to find body parts and corpses everywhere and dead sheep and also the truck burning. We also found, well, there was nothing left. The planes were circling overhead. We fled, but we hadn't reached the causeway yet when the fourth bombardment took place. They were the last two rockets that hit them. At the time, I couldn't grasp what was going on. The truck was burning. It was a big truck, but it was ripped to pieces. Nothing remained except the number plate and the tires that you saw. We saw three corpses, but the rest were just body parts. And also the sheep. With the last rocket, I could see the sheep blasted into the air. The rocket burned an area of 100 square meters, total incineration. In the last bombardment, the planes were very low. We could see them with the naked eye. That's when it fired two rockets simultaneously. That deep crater near the road that you saw, and the one near it. That was the last bombardment. I personally witnessed it. Nobody told me or described it to me. As for sheep, I lost exactly 180 head, and there were six dead people. My father, who was 70 years old, my brother, who was 35 years old, also died, along with his four children. That's six people. One boy was a 15-year-old student, another was 12 years old, his name was Mohammed. Matada was 11 years old, and Sultan, who was five or six years old. He hadn't been accepted into school yet. He told me, Uncle, they'll accept me next year. God Almighty didn't let him do it. We belong to God, and to him we shall return. I'm sick and in pain. Imagine in the morning or at dinner, in the evening, not finding six members of your household sitting next to you. It used to be crowded. I think I'll remember that for years. I don't cry only once every day, I cry four or five times. I get very emotional thinking about what happened. You can look around you and as far as the eye can see, this is a totally isolated, desolate place. And it would have been visible as that from the air, very much so. But with the sheep are these small child shepherds and other members of the family. When I got back to London, I rang the Ministry of Defence and I said, I've just come back from Mosul and you are 
bombing sheep. And I wondered if you have a comment. And the official said to me, without missing a beat, we reserve the right to take robust action if threatened. And I said, against sheep. And at that point, I gave up. This is an internal United Nations report prepared by the UN Security Section. It reveals that in one five-month period, almost half the victims of the bombing were civilians in targets that included a residential area, villages, a fisherman's jetty, farmland, and sheep. I spoke to Hans von Sponick by phone in Baghdad just before he resigned. He told me about the latest bombing figures. During the period 1 January to um, 15 September 1999, we here in Baghdad, in the United Nations, recorded 99 airstrikes uh, in both the southern and the northern no-fly zones. On 23 occasions, UN staff had either seen or heard the strikes or also felt the shock waves. And on three occasions, I, myself, with colleagues, was witness of um, civilian casualties. Why is it idealistic to suggest that those children should be allowed to live? And there's no question in the minds of, again I go back to it, senior United Nations officials who are administering the humanitarian relief there, that these children would live were the sanctions lifted. I can't accept their judgment for it. Our sense is that prior to sanctions, there were serious poverty and health problems in Iraq. So to suggest that when you wave the sanctions wand, that suddenly all the problems in Iraq go away is not true. We, our hearts go out to the people who live in Iraq as much as anybody. Mm -hmm. But we have to make real decisions that have real consequences in, in the countries in the region, in dealing with the Kurdish problem, where Saddam Hussein has gassed the Kurds. This is a reality. It's a much, much more stark reality than the question of to what extent sanctions have harmed the people of Iraq. We have to weigh our profound sorrow at the tragic suffering of the people of Iraq against the national security uh, challenge and that Saddam Hussein would uh, pose to the world if he weren't checked by uh, the sanctions regime and the containment policy. That's the, the, the policymakers' ultimate calculation. But the best prospect of us achieving a solution through diplomatic measures is to leave Saddam Hussein in no doubt about our resolve to win this struggle. The United States and Great Britain stand shoulder to shoulder in our assessment. We believe that the situation in Iraq is very grave. For two months, we requested an interview with the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, and were told he didn't want to appear in a film with dying babies. I wanted to ask Mr. Cook if he agreed with his American friend, Madeleine Albright, that the death of half a million children was a price worth paying for sanctions. I wanted to ask him why Iraqi children are denied vital medical supplies like vaccine, and why British and American bombs rain down on children. Only two people were unavailable to appear in this film, Saddam Hussein and Robin Cook. This raises an important issue. Unlike all the others you've seen interviewed, only the Foreign Office demanded special treatment, an exclusive screening of the film, followed by a 10-minute uncut contribution by Mr. Cook right at the end. In other words, they wanted editorial control. Is that how accountability in a democracy works these days? What is the British government frightened of? What have they got to hide? People can argue the 
motives and politics and options of sanctions, but at the end of the day, that policy is causing the death of thousands and thousands of people who in my eyes and in anybody's eyes are nothing but hostages. They did not choose Saddam Hussein. They did not choose or support his policies. They are caught literally in this circle and they die. They die every day. This is Mohammed Ghani, Iraq's most famous sculptor. You know, my studio just near the hospital of the children. I am go around every day near the hospital. And I see how very sad the women carry the children and waiting. Uh, you know, like this, exactly, in the front of the, of the uh, hospital. They're waiting for medicine, they're waiting for, uh, you know, food, for the waiting doctor, they're waiting. So this is the woman in front of the hospital doors. Each woman carry her children in her hand, you see. It's very evocative because the door is closed. Closed. Mm -hmm. So they, they come to hospital before the official time. I mean, the 8 o'clock, they come before 8 o'clock, waiting, waiting. And that's true. And they're waiting uh, the woman in front of the hospital. So this is, this is sculpture as life as it is being lived, life and death, yes, in I, Iraq I, now. You know, yeah. my, my opinion, I do yeah. many things, but this one, you know, make me very sad, sad. I, I, I do it. As the same, the same thing I feel that woman, for example, you know, uh, she have no milk. She's empty. The breast is empty. She's no milk, and the children, uh, with the hands over, he want milk and she cannot give him, and he cannot reach, and because, and between them is very sad things here inside. This is a symbolic of all women, all Iraq. I look around myself and my my neighbors and my around me. The people, every day they have problems. Every day. This is the idea of Saturday, Sunday, that, that every day they have very heavy or oh, so this is the burden the, on their shoulders. The them. This is the embargo, symbolic of the embargo for my very heavy pieces, bigger than them. They cannot support it. Look, uh, this, each figure and each movement different than the others. If every day they have a new problem. Every day they have a new uh, sadness, every day new things, but you can see how they feel, how they are very sad uh, and scratch and scratch them. So this is an idea, my idea, no one asked me to do it, I did it. At the dawn of the new millennium, how is Western civilization to be judged by the fine words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights words like the right to life, or by the denial of that right to a whole nation, do the representatives of the powerful who sit here in the Security Council ever think beyond their so-called interests and maneuvers and about their victims, small children dying needlessly half a world away? And do those politicians who tell us about their ethical policies and moral crusades ever ask the question, by whose divine authority do they punish 21 million people for the misconduct of a dictator? We think the price is worth it, says Madeleine Albright. No, it is not, and it never will be, and it's time we reclaim the United Nations. While you've been watching this film, countless children have died silently in Iraq. How many more will die before the silence is broken?